mixed martial arts is a polarizing subject, brutal to some, beautiful to others. Detractors argue against a lack of decency, while diehards rebute a lack of understanding. The truth remains that mixed martial arts is an international billion-dollar industry that packs stadiums, floods pay-per-views, and shakes up pop culture. But what's the source of this success? By understanding the history of mixed martial arts, it becomes clear that this sport has been immensely popular, longer than detractors would admit. The earliest semblance of mixed martial arts can be traced back to the ancient Greek Olympic Games. The forgotten sport of Pancratian pitted two Olympians against each other in a hybrid form of combat that combined the skills of grappling and striking. Pancratian's limited rules only prohibited biting or eye gouging, and competitions were won by either knockout or submission. One of the most popular events for centuries, Pancratian was abolished after the Roman disbanding of the Olympics, and it would be over a millennium before another competition of its kind would gain similar popularity. After the dissolution of Pancratian, the individual combat sports of grappling and striking continued to develop separately. Both amateur boxing and wrestling became flagship events in the modern Olympic Games. Professional boxing resonated throughout Europe in the 1700s, and professional kickboxing grew in prominence when the Thai version, Muay Thai, became the country's national sport in the early 20th century. Even traditional martial arts appeared sporadically in the combat sporting arena, including karate, jiu-jitsu, kung fu, and taekwondo. However, it wasn't until the growth and evolution of professional wrestling that hybrid styles of fighting, reminiscent of Pancratian, began to re-emerge on a large scale. Professional wrestling, to this day, is a highly popular worldwide sport. The early popularity of professional wrestling started in the United States after the Civil War. Unlike the choreographed spectacle of modern professional wrestling, these early competitions drew large crowds simply by pitting famous strongmen against each other. The rule sets for these competitions revolved around winning by pinning the opponent, with no strikes and very few submission holds allowed. These rules eventually changed with the introduction of foreign styles of grappling, like Japanese sumo and Indian pelwani, promoting a competition called No Holds Barred, a moniker later used in tangent with mixed martial arts. The term No Holds Barred originated in local challenge matches and eventually traveling carnival acts. Carnival strongmen would demonstrate wrestling moves that not only pinned opponents, but also forced them to submit under extreme pain or threat of injury. These submission holds, many of which were banned in professional wrestling, became the draw of these carnival acts, advertising that no holds were barred. A large number of these holds came from an English style of wrestling called catch as catch can. Also known as catch wrestling, this style heavily emphasized hooking or quickly locking onto a body joint to cause severe pain. Wrestlers proficient in this style, often called hookers, could end matches quickly despite the size and strength of their opponent, which made for an enticing carnival attraction. The challenge was made for all comers to grapple with the wrestler for a certain period of time without having to submit, a feat very few achieved. Professional wrestling promoters noticed the popularity of these carnival acts and started bringing the no-holds-barred style of fighting to large arenas. They also borrowed the underhanded practice of work matches. Also known as works, in these carnival matches, wrestlers intentionally lost to an accomplice, known as a ringer, and they lured potential challengers into a false sense of confidence. On a grander scale, professional wrestling promoters used works to drive box office sales, and they continue to do so today. It was the departure from these choreographed productions that led to the next evolution in professional wrestling, which evolved into the earliest direct predecessor to mixed martial arts. Although work started becoming a mainstay in professional wrestling, sometimes competitors would go off script, insinuating a full-on brawl. When a match made the sudden shift, it was no longer called a work, but a shoot. During shoots, rules were often abandoned as wrestlers would try to incapacitate each other with a crippling submission hold or a knockout. Promoters capitalized on this dramatic change of direction and choreographed works to look like shoots by adding strikes. The shoot style eventually became, and still is, the standard for professional wrestling. Actual shoots were few and far between, but this newfound interest in striking and grappling blended fights led to the advent of challenge matches between wrestlers and boxers, sometimes called anything goes matches. 
Relegated to small clubs, with the occasional exhibition on a professional fight card, these matches were novel at best and never caught the lasting eye of a broader audience. It wasn't until shoot-style wrestling spread outside the United States that the concept of blended striking and grappling belts would emerge as a reputable spectator sport. Meanwhile, the no-holds-barred style was making professional wrestling easier for international collaboration. Wrestlers trained in foreign styles could compete against each other under the less prohibitive rule sets. Promoters began advertising world champions as wrestlers traveled from country to country, challenging national champs for the coveted title. Wrestlers used this international exposure to advertise their unique styles to worldwide audiences. One style addition to the international wrestling circuit became pivotal to the development of mixed martial arts. Japanese judo practitioners, or judokas, began to emerge on the worldwide wrestling scene in the early 20th century. A recently developed style of jiu-jitsu, judo introduced unique pins and submission holds to no-holds-barred wrestling, much like catch wrestling did before it. The judo influence on professional wrestling can be directly traced to a birthing point in the history of mixed martial arts when it arrived in Brazil. The international popularity of professional wrestling combined with the heavy influx of Japanese migrating to Brazil during the First World War, led to the country's initial interest in both no-holds-barred and judo. One professional wrestler and judoka, Mitsuyo Maeda, was instrumental in combining the two sports into a fighting style that led to the creation of mixed martial arts. After gaining attention for his wrestling bouts in Brazil, Maeda began teaching his no-holds-barred style of judo to a select group of locals. One of his students, Carlos Gracie, saw the opportunity to market and promote this modified style of judo as a new martial art that combined the spectacle of professional wrestling with the practicality of traditional martial arts. Carlos involved many of his family in building an enterprise based on this style of fighting, eventually trademarked as Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This enterprise would include high-profile training facilities, public demonstrations, and a new type of competition that wasn't wrestling or judo, but something that resembled a more ancient sport. Subsequent competitions were called the Gracie Challenge. Fighting members of the family held an open challenge to all comers, reminiscent of the catch wrestling hookers and traveling carnivals. Unlike no holds barred or even shoot style wrestling matches, these challenges didn't prohibit any techniques and could only be won by either knockout or submission, practically identical to pan -cradian. There were no weight classes and no time limits. The biggest selling point for these matches was the exploitation of Carlos's younger brother, Helio. Helio Gracie, Carlos's weaker sibling, devised modifications to the family style, allowing him to use each technique with surprising effectiveness, despite his lack of physical strength. This breakthrough helped catapult the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu enterprise to a new level of popularity. Helio was put at the forefront of the Gracie Challenge and used his modified style to submit substantially bigger and stronger opponents. This gave him legendary status in Brazil and eventually made Gracie Jiu-Jitsu a household name. The Gracies continued to build their name with no rules challenge matches throughout the first half of the 20th century. Many of the Gracie fighters and their challengers built the model for the modern day mixed martial artists. Notable opposition included fighters from Fada Academy, another school taught by Mitsuo Maeda, and Luta Livre, a style derived from catch wrestling that eventually blended with Muay Thai. Each of these schools have and continue to produce superstars in mixed martial arts. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century and the televising of these challenge matches that they gained recognition as legitimate sporting events. Local networks began airing the challenges, dubbing them a new sport named Vale Tudo, the Portuguese translation for anything goes. Several events on separate stations pitted the legendary Gracies against their heated rivals. Although Vale Tudo gained a ravenous fan base in Brazil, it struggled to cross over into international mainstream success on the level of professional wrestling. Due to the violent nature of the rule set and a few gruesome televised incidents, Vale Tudo was eventually taken off the air and fell into obscurity. The next big iteration of Vale Tudo emerged in the United States in the 1990s. It materialized when the Gracie Challenge came to America along with the second generation of the family fighters. One of Helio's sons, Horian Gracie, sought to expand the Gracie enterprise by opening a school in California and promoting it with the Gracie Challenge. Once again, 
these challenges went in a local legend, but didn't find widespread popularity until they captured a TV audience. Horian partnered with Hollywood producers to televise a live Valley Tudo tournament and engineer a spectacle that could sell as a pay-per-view event. Since the term Valley Tudo was vastly unheard of in America, the event was called the Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC. The Gracies didn't have the same caliber of opposition they faced in Brazil while transplanting to the States, so they challenged master martial artists to represent their individual fighting styles in the tournament. Drawing from the popularity of martial arts films like Jean-Claude Van Damme's Bloodsport and Chuck Norris's The Octagon. In the same way that Carlos had marketed Helio, Horian chose his younger brother Hoyce to be the sole representative of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He was billed as the smallest and physically weakest competitor at the event. Horian's goal was to use whatever fame his brother achieved through the high profile tournament to cement the Gracie Jiu Jitsu enterprise in the United States but inadvertently, he set a new sport into motion. The UFC was an overnight success. The spectacle of using an octagon-shaped cage instead of a ring, combined with the shocking violence of Valet Tudo, instantly set it apart from any other combat sport witnessed by a large audience. The scheme to build celebrity for Hoist paid off when he used his family style to defeat much larger opponents en route to winning the big tournament. Like Helio, Hoist earned legendary status and helped put Gracie Jiu Jitsu at the forefront of both combat sports and traditional martial arts. Hoist inspired a new generation of combat sport athletes to cross train in Gracie Jiu Jitsu in order to effectively compete in Valley Tudo events. Due to his graphic violence, however, the UFC was instantly met with backlash from political authorities. Individual states began banning the competitions, prompting the show's constant relocation to any region that would sanction the events. Similar tournaments also began emerging to overshadow the success of the UFC. The sudden saturation of the market, combined with political pressure and lack of exposure, nearly sunk the organization. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, the professional wrestling roots of mixed martial arts were redeveloping into a better received version of the sport. The already fanatical sport of Japanese professional wrestling was drastically changed when the shoot style was adopted in the 1970s. Just as Mitsuo Maeda brought his noho barred style of judo to Brazil, a wrestler named Carl Gotch brought his shoot style of catch wrestling to Japan during his tour of the world wrestling circuit. Gotch collaborated with local wrestlers, many with traditional martial arts experience, to create a more elaborate shoot style of wrestling called shoot fighting. Shoot fighting combined the grappling style of catch wrestling with the striking styles of karate and Muay Thai, similar to the Luta Livre fighters of Brazil. The rules of shoot fighting were much more prohibitive than those of Valet Tudo, still granting victory by knockout or submission, but restricting a large assortment of strikes. This new style was gradually shoehorned into the Japanese professional wrestling circuit when promoters either put shoot fighting bouts on wrestling cards or branched off into shoot fighting only promotions. Although these contests were advertised as real fights, the majority were still worked matches. One famous wrestler in particular sought to re-image the public perception of shoot fighting by resurrecting the Anything Goes exhibitions that died off in the United States. In the mid 70s, professional wrestler Antonio Inoki used his celebrity to host invitational shoot fighting matches between strikers and grapplers. Peaking when Inoki himself faced off against legendary boxer Muhammad Ali to a sold out crowd. Demand for Anything Goes exhibitions caused some promoters to actively distance shoot fighting from professional wrestling. In the late 80s, an organization called Shuto was the first to disavow professional wrestling and the notion of worked matches, with bouts convincingly ending in brutal knockouts and submissions. As Shudo prohibited fewer techniques than other shoot fighting organizations, they also pioneered new safety standards in the sport, like the use of padded gloves and the establishment of amateur divisions. Practitioners referred to this new style of shoot fighting as NHB, a throwback to no holds barred. In the early 90s, one NHB promotion ingeniously helmed the name Pancrates, short for Pancradian. Pancrates positioned itself for international success courting some of the best fighters in the world, many of whom would eventually become mixed martial arts royalty. Incidentally, it wasn't until the shoot fighting world of Pancrates collided with the Valet Tudo inspired world of the UFC that the sport of mixed martial arts would have a foreseeable future. 
Although Hoist Gracie shocked the world by submitting the bigger, stronger competitors at the first UFC, a single threat lingered when Pancrase champion Ken Shamrock entered the tournament. Shamrock's NHB style of shoot fighting gave him an advantage over the tournament competition in experience in grappling, striking, blended fighting. In their fateful pairing, despite a back and forth exchange, Gracie eventually submitted the shoot fighter. This began a long and storied rivalry, not just between the two fighters, but also between the sports of shoot fighting and valet tudo. Japanese promoters started emulating the valet tudo style of the UFC to both satisfy the growing demand for NHB and to legitimize the country's roster of shoot fighters. A year after the first UFC, the Shudo promotion hosted the first Valet Tudo Japan event, facing off local shoot fighters against a new contingent of UFC-inspired Valet Tudo fighters. Due to the traveling legend of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and Hoist's defeat of Ken Shamrock, a member of the Gracie family was sought to headline the event. Instead of Royce, however, his brother and storied family champion Hickson would be the ambassador of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in the tournament, and subsequently Japan as a whole, further expanding the family enterprise. Hickson handedly won Valet Tudo Japan, captivating Japanese audiences by fueling the rivalry between shoot fighting and Valet Tudo, and more specifically, Japanese fighters versus the Gracies. With the decline of the UFC in the United States, aspiring Valet Tudo fighters, along with a large contingent of the Gracie family, traveled to Japan to fight in these rivalry themed events. Free from the political pressure endured by the UFC, Promoters were able to secure major TV deals and book some of Japan's largest venues. In the US, the UFC was making strides to not only survive, but also ensure a future for the sport now called MMA, or mixed martial arts. They began distancing the perception of MMA from the violence associated with Valet Tudo or even NHB. By expanding the MMA rule set to prohibit a larger pool of dangerous techniques, Along with standardizing weight classes and time limits, the UFC and rival promotions collaborating with state athletic commissions to ratify the unified rules of mixed martial arts by the turn of the century. This collaborative effort to indoctrinate the responsibility of promoters to ensure fighter safety helped gradually lift the individual state bans on MMA. The American MMA industry was on the rise, but still couldn't match the success of Japanese NHB ruled by an organization built on the shoot fighting versus valet tudo rivalry called Pride Fighting Championship. It wasn't until the acquisition of the UFC by Las Vegas magnate Station Casinos that it finally soared over all competition. Under new management, the UFC invested large amounts of money to expand the marketing appeal of MMA. This marketing push paid off when the UFC used the timely trend of reality TV to land an MMA themed show on cable network Spike TV. The Ultimate Fighter debuted in 2005 to surprising success. In the reality show format, audiences witnessed the personal struggles of fighters as they competed in a season-long tournament to win a six-figure fight contract. The live season finale featured finalists Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin in one of the greatest fights in UFC history, which generated a sharp spike in ratings and almost instantaneously gave the UFC long-awaited mainstream success. Soon after, UFC pay-per-view sales, box office returns, and public notoriety began to grow exponentially. The UFC would become the worldwide leader in mixed martial arts and help MMA become one of the fastest growing sports. The company went on to acquire rival promotions and absorb their fighters into the UFC roster, including their stiffest worldwide competition, Japan's Pride Fighting Championship. The height of the UFC's success came in 2011 when they landed an extensive TV deal on the Fox network, broadcasting their MMA events on the same platform as Major League Sports. This new level of exposure allowed UFC fighters to bring celebrity to the sport of MMA. UFC champions, including Chuck Liddell, Randy Couture, and George St. Pierre, became ambassadors of MMA in news media, TV, and film. Professional wrestling superstar Brock Lesnar brought crossover potential when he braved his way to a UFC title. Female audiences were engaged when the UFC spotlighted women's MMA, championed by the hugely popular judo Olympic medalist turned professional fighter Ronda Rousey. The UFC also expanded its international visibility by securing large venues and TV deals in many foreign nations. To the general public, 
the UFC became synonymous with MMA, but rival organizations continued to diversify the sport. Promoters would fit the bill for big name talent or deviate from the universal rules of mixed martial arts to gain notoriety. Another phenomenon in the growing landscape of MMA was the demand for hybrid style martial arts. Seemingly obscure martial arts that utilize grappling and striking in full contact competitions were suddenly in favor. Arts like Russian Sambo, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, and even a revitalized form of Pancratian, pronounced Pancration, were central to the restructuring across the martial arts world that groomed practitioners to compete in MMA. At the core of this new era in martial arts were the original inspirations for MMA, catch wrestling, Muay Thai, and Gracie Jiu Jitsu, also known as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. These styles individually and collaboratively made a mark in the martial arts industry, as people looked to MMA as not only a revolution in sports, but also the future of unarmed combat. MMA gyms started cornering the martial arts consumer market, providing kids classes, certified rankings, and self-defense courses. Even the US military and some law enforcement agencies have adopted MMA-inspired curriculums into their unarmed combat training. Mixed martial arts has come a long way from ancient Greek stadiums to traveling carnival acts to major pay-per-view events. On the journey, legends have been made and industries have been changed forever. Few are certain about the future of the sport, but if history repeats itself, MMA will never truly disappear. It may take on a different name and appearance, but there's no denying one of the world's oldest and most popular sports from continued existence.